The Sinclair QL was Sir Clive's next big attempt to break into the business market. Oh. Oh. But could it compete with the rising dominance of IBM PCs and machines from Atari, Commodore and Apple? Right. <laughs> well, here's the Sinclair QL box, uh, slightly beaten up as you can see this one. <laughs> And uh, well, we'll, we'll just unbox it. Hey, we've got an unboxing. <laughs> it's unusual we do these. Normally I uh, I have the machines out already, but in this case the box contains quite a lot of stuff, so it's kind of worth doing. Um, I will try to deafen the sound of the polystyrene though. Go inside, we have the polys that have been embossed with the Sinclair QL. And removing this, there we go, we're straight into the machine. So yep, yeah, here is, this is the Sinclair QL. Uh, it's based around a Motorola 68008, which was an attempt to make building a 68,000 computer cheaper by switching it to an 8-bit external data bus. This meant that machines built around it were slower than normal 68,000 machines but they should be faster than other 8-bit ones because the internal buses were still faster. Yeah, it's um, it's a striking design. There's no doubt about that. Another Rick Dickinson, obviously. His industrial design is pretty amazing. Uh, so if we look here, these are our two micro drive slots, which are, of course, the main uh, storage mechanism of these machines. Uh, yeah, the, the keyboard, which we'll definitely talk about later a little bit, uh, which is uh, yeah very, very reminiscent of the, the Plus keyboard. And on the back, various different serial ports. So um, these are the proprietary network ports. Uh, this is the RGB, which is compatible with the uh, Spectral 128K compatible uh, Spectral 128K uh, RGB cable. Uh, the proprietary power lead, you can see it's like a weird shaped free pin thing. RF out if you want to plug it into a TV that way. And these are all the serial ports and some controller ports which are add-ons. So these, yeah, these um, are based around the BT telephone standards. Uh, some revisions that were exported by Samsung do not have these type ports. They have DE9 ports instead. That's where the ROM cartridges would um, go into. That will flip up. That's also where the uh, ex the dongle for the earlier models would have plugged into. Again, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, this is interesting. Oh. And on this side we have a reset button. Always handy. Right, well that's the machine. Again, yeah, it's a striking machine. Well, let's see what else we get in the box. So we have a couple of wallets of microdrives. These are the official programs that came with it. So uh, Cure Archive, which is a, like a databasing thing. Uh, Abacus, which is a spreadsheet. Uh, Quill, which is a word processor. And Easel, which is a paint package. These were developed by uh, Scion. You can see from the front there, uh, which is kind of the things so I, I look, I got a, an Acon branded Scion free the other day, and their spreadsheet is also called Abacus, which is a bit of a weird thing, but that's uh, obviously where <laughs> we see that's a continuation there, right? And these were a bunch of basically of blank ones, micro drives with some labels and things that you could label them up. These ones have got duplicates of the built in software, which is you did it with micro drives, a very good idea. I think these are standoff blocks so you can raise the keyboard up to try to make it at least slightly comfortable. Um, here we have a printer, I think this is standard, that's a Centronics printer interface. Um, well, a games cartridge, I suspect that doesn't work. We'll try it out later though, hey, why not? <laughs> and, oh, another games cartridge. And another games cartridge. So, hey, maybe one of them will work. Uh, yeah, the power lead again. Well, it's got that proprietary plug on it, and this is oh, the rest of the space is <laughs> taken up with this giant user guide. Look at this. 
That's astonishing. That's huge ring binder. <laughs> and so this has got all the instructions for using the machine and also for each of these included applications as well. And also a bit of super basic code as well. Um, yeah, astonishing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do love these huge manuals. This is how manuals used to be, by the way, back in the back in the old days. <laughs> and it's fantastic. And yeah, I I just noticed the polystyrene slopes down to take to make this level. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful design of packaging there. Right, uh, we should get some more of the machine, shouldn't we? Really? Uh, yeah. So the six eight eight six eight zero zero eight choice. Uh, kind of instantly impacted what this could do. It was designed obviously to compete with, with uh, quite a few 68k base machines as well as IBM PCs, but straight out of the box, uh, there was little chance it was going to be able to compete with the Apple Mac uh, or the Amiga or ST because those had full fledged 68,000s and for the same clock speed, they would always be faster because of the increased bus size. But it did make it obviously a lot cheaper than those machines. So it was, uh, you know, swings and roundabouts and all that. Uh, by default, it comes with 128k of memory. This is officially expandable to 640k, but uh, theoretically and, well, actually now potentially expandable to uh, 896k, which is what the uh, reduced address bus can uh, can address. It had two graphic modes. 256 by 256 which had supported eight base colors and 512 by 256 which supported four um relatively high resolution for the time um obviously there were a few machines could do similar resolutions uh, outside of the 16-bit ones <laughs> and yeah we've already talked about them briefly but in place of what was becoming um moderately standard uh floppy drives it has these micro drives instead these are obviously proprietary to Sinclair um, uh, they're effectively you've never seen a micro drive before uh, we take out one of these blank ones uh, well first of all they're, they're awful just just so you know uh, having been somebody who had to use them in the past I can tell you they're definitely awful uh, they're effectively they're just fast loops of magnetic tape so they're basically tapes but they run a lot faster and on a loop. So they are far, far faster than the tape drive is. They're not as fast or nor can they hold as much as a disc, but they're kind of, I guess, a midway house in terms of magnetic media. Massively unreliable. Tapes break. The data becomes erased. The micro drives have got all kinds of gubbins to keep them going and they, they go wrong quite a lot. Later models were improved, but um, yeah, they're, they're not great drives. That uh, We've gotten to that. <laughs> A little later as well. Uh, the QL planning started in 1981 under the code name of the ZX83. That's followed on from the Spectrum's code name of ZX82, which was because it was a successor to the ZX80 and ZX81 computers. Originally, the QL was being planned as a portable system using one of Sinclair's flat screen mini displays, similar to those used in their TV80 product. It was a big thing that Sinclair was developing was the this flat screen technology. It was very advanced for its time as well. It's, it's kind of those little things that people forget about Sir Clive Sinclair. He was a very intelligent man. And he had some very intelligent people working for him and they made some very good products. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the portable system just proved too hard to make with all the features they wanted. And so it was scrapped and it became this desktop model instead. Uh, originally, Sinclair contracted GST Computer Systems to produce the OZ for the QL, but eventually they went for an in-house solution. Uh, GST 68K OZ, though, was made available as an uh, add-on ROM pack. And GST's tools, a lot of the development stuff, were eventually got ported to the Atari ST, and uh, the GST format became a bit of a standard on the Atari ST. Uh, Sinclair announced the QL will be available on the 12th of January 1984 and started taking pre-orders. As it turned out, the machine was far from ready by the time the, the day arrived. Uh, these delays caused a lot of criticism and a bit of a slap on the wrist from the Advertising Standards Agency. Well, you know, Sinclair got away with a lot with that. I don't know if they get away with it nowadays, but yeah. Uh, Sinclair had a bit of a, a, bit of a uh, previous with the uh, ASA. 
Uh, as it happens, these early adopters may have wished for even more delays because when the QR was released, it was far from a complete computer. Design issues and an incredibly buggy ROM required an add-on dongle, uh, which was kind of always poking out the back of there. The microdrives proved to be even less reliable than previous incarnations. Uh, the, yeah, the, the microdrives had also appeared on the Sinclair Spectrum as an add-on thing using Interface 1. Um, they were unreliable, but yeah, these ones from the original versions, I think these versions are the better ones in here. They, uh, they, yeah, they were quite unreliable, breaking down and causing tape breaks. Whilst these issues were eventually fixed, with several redesigns increasing the internal ROM size to fix all the bugs and the missing features, and vastly improving the reliability of microdrives, the damage was already done. In what was already an uphill battle against IBM, the business community had lost faith with Sinclair and the QL. When Sinclair sold his business to Amstrad, the QL was quickly dropped, although production had already ended the year before. Reliability, the insistence on using microdrives, which were not trusted by business or software publishers, and the fact that the keyboard was the same as that on the Sinclair Plus, <laughs> yeah. uh, a machine that, which was seen as little more than a toy, it all sold very poorly. Um, didn't really sell especially well overseas, although Samsung did release a few overseas models for Sinclair, but yeah, it didn't sell well at all. This is why these are relatively rare. Not very rare, but they do have a premium because they're, they don't come up that often. Uh, when the QL was officially uh, dropped, a number of companies used the hardware uh, to create their own designs. Uh, one of the probably the, the most well known of these is ICL's One Per Desk, um, which I do have, but yeah, didn't think to bring it up with me, but you know, fine. <laughs> there is a video on it, which is a part of a series which I have yet to complete um, because I blew it up, but I will fix it. Uh, yeah, so I says one per desk was basically a uh, Sinclair QL guts with a phone system add on, so it could be used as a kind of a phone system. Uh, it was moderately successful with some business. Um, customers, especially government agencies, and was eventually used to create a, um, a, a networked bingo system, which was <laughs> fairly fascinating use and a very British use of, of a, a computer system. Uh, and one of the QL's main claim to frames is the fact that Linus Torvalds uh, credits credit it as being one of his inspirations for creating Linux, uh, mainly because the QL was so badly uh, supported especially in his homeland of Finland that he was used to making all of his own software and so working with that and the the preemptive multitasking uh, system he got that inspiration and when he moved on to IBM PCs he started creating Linux, uh, Linux, Linux, you want to call it. <laughs> and so yeah this this kind of has a root in that which you know it's kind of interesting little thing for the QL because it doesn't have a huge amount more yeah, so, I mean, it's, I like it. I like owning it. Um, it's not a good machine, not in, in any kind of sense of the word. Had it used a full blown 68,000, maybe it would have been better, but then it also would have been quite a lot more expensive as well. Uh, not because the 68,000 was necessarily an expensive chip, but it required a lot more chips to make it work. Um, because of its, its different bus sizes and stuff, because, uh, this, this was really a cut down version to make machines cheaper, the 68008. But, uh, yeah, it kind of, it was hampered by that fact. The machines that it was competing against didn't have that drawback. And so they kind of instantly had <laughs> an advantage. Um, and it was never going to be popular in the business community. The IBM PC was really taking over that market anyway. And, and this keyboard was just, it's not one you want to use for long periods of time. Uh, the keys are very, you know, they're very solid when you hit them. And yeah, <laughs> but it was, it was to Clive wanting to get into that business market to be taken seriously. Um, after the Sinclair Spectrum, which became really mostly known for games. You can kind of understand why he he just kind of threw everything at the wall, um, but he still tried to do it in as cheap a way as possible because that's the so class Sinclair. Yeah, unfortunate, but then he wasn't to know that IBM would win that market so so massively either. So uh, 
yeah, a shame. Uh, would I recommend buying one? Mm, not especially, no. They're not massively reliable machines for a start. The proprietary power supply uh, is especially difficult to get up and running. Uh, the micro drives are awful. Well, they, there are alternatives now as well and uh, that you can plug into this thing. There are uh, custom-made um, connectors and stuff, and you can technically add things like 3.5-inch disk drives to it as well, as well as SD solutions. But, yeah, it's just... Whilst it's an intriguing piece of technology, there's nothing like particularly great about it in the sense that there was with the Spectrum and with things like the Amiga and the Atari ST. So the difficulty and cost of getting one doesn't really equate to good reasons for owning one, which is, it's a shame it is, but if they were cheaper, if you could find one cheaper, then it's worth it. But if it's missing the power supply, then that's a whole pain right there to try and get that working. It is possible, but it's, it's a big pain. Um, so yeah, if you're missing that, then it's, it's just not worth it. <laughs> right. Let's try to get some software running. Um, to show you how much faith I've got in the micro drive, as soon as I finish saying this, I am then going to do an outro <laughs> because I'm relatively sure I'm not going to be able to get anything running to the point where it's worth recording it, but we will try. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it will at least power up, so maybe I can at least show you super basic. But anyway, all right. So, yeah, I will see you in a minute. So here we are at the first screen you see when you boot up the QL. And, yeah, it's asking for a monitor or TV. Um, now, we are running via the RGB SCART, so we can push F1 for monitor. So F1. That works well. F1. Come on. Great. Right, well, at least we got this far. <laughs> As it turns out, I don't get to see if the micro drives are working or not, because the other big flaw in the QL, which is one I actually did forget to mention, is that it's still using a membrane keyboard, which will just randomly not work. This one has stopped working. <laughs> So yeah, the uh, I can push F1 or F2 or anything as much as I want and none of them are working. <sighs> yeah, so that will be the other reason not to buy a QL. How oh, well. <laughs> Right. Thanks for watching. I mean, I gave my thoughts on the QL. I, I do kind of stand by them. Whilst it's a fascinating machine, it's not fascinating enough to cope with its difficulties and with uh, the, the cost of actually owning one. But um, yeah, I, I like owning it, to be honest, but it, mainly because I, I'm a huge Sinclair fan because of uh, that's how I started in the computer industry. So owning all of his machines, that, that, that makes me happy. Anyway. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit like. If you really enjoyed the video, please hit subscribe. If you didn't enjoy the video or you have something else to say, then please leave it in the comments below. See you next time.